The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents No Neutrality, where we have a roundtable of contributors pushing the antithesis in every area of life. From family to government, apologetics to homeschooling, being a wife and a mother, a husband, a father, single, widow, business owner, or employee, you will hear commentary, essays, lectures, blogs, and battle plans on how to bring forth the Christian worldview to all of life. I tried to do this about a year ago and did not like the result at all. Today, I am um, in my secret bunker. Actually, this is where I work as a... Uh, this is the back room of my Cosba. But I thought I'd share with you some scriptures on a Sunday that uh, sort of blew me away when I was looking at them. I was surprised in a sub-thread this past week when someone was at length, about 40 posts worth, defending the idea that adoption is evil and nowhere to be found in the Bible. That it wasn't until the last few posts, after all this, I'll just, I'm, I'm reading through it, that someone, two people actually, mentioned in passing that our relationship to God is an adoptive relationship, but it was just sort of in passing. I thought, surely adoption's important. So I started this study off the top of my head. I just wanted to share a few verses. It was a sub-thread of a sub-thread. And about an hour later, I was blown away by how much I had forgotten as it all started coming back. Old age is great that way because in case you're like me, um, what you'll find is there's stuff that you think, yeah, that's pretty important. You go to look at it and you think, holy cow, you had no idea how important that was. I apologize to all of you who do not believe in holy cows. Scripture is clear. Our natural parents cannot support us. And if left up to them or left with them, we would die. They know that those who sin against God deserve death. Yet they not only do those things themselves, they build cultures that approve of those things, making them seem perfectly natural to us. Now John opens the ministry of Christ saying the whole purpose of the second person of the Trinity was to enable us to become the children of God, adopted out of the world, away from our natural parents. John 1, 12, 13 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision of or a husband's will, but born of God. Now in John 3.16, this, this adoption idea comes through very strongly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You remember this, this was in the discussion with Nicodemus, where Jesus said, uh, you must be born again. Now, being born again is how you join a family. So uh, we are adopted into God's family. Since he's not talking about physical rebirth, he's talking about a spiritual transaction in which we become members of a new family. We're born into it. In that new family, we're renamed by God. We take on his name. And here's the, here's the mind blower. God takes on our name. You know, we just sort of take for granted the name of God is get the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This isn't a mere description of God. This is the name of God. Who do you worship? I worship the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, that God. See, his name is the God of Joe Washburn Jr. He's the God of Jeremy Foreman, the God of Mark Thomas uh, Barker. Someday he may become even the name of Janine Jensen. Who knows? He's adopting new children all the time. He loves a lot of people right now that have no idea about it. This is God's name, though, and it's your new name. It's the first thing that happens to you. He becomes your God. He takes on your name. In Revelation 2.17, we're told that, that uh, he renames you and gives you a name that only you and he will know. He renames you, writing it all in the palms of his hands, we're told in Isaiah 49.16. That's, that's something schoolgirls do. And yet the God of the universe says, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way I think of you. It's right there on the palm of my hand. You're that close to me. You know, he's closer to his adopted child than a mother is to her natural child. He asked the question again in Isaiah, can a woman forget her nursing child? Yet if she does, I still will not forget you. That's what your new father says. 
In 2 Corinthians 6.18, he promises, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. But it's Hebrews 2.10 and the verses following that that keeps coming back to our adoption from the family of death into the family of life of God with Jesus Christ, who's our older brother. It says, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation, Jesus Christ, perfect through what he suffered, both the one who makes his people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, here am I and the children God has given me. You know, as I was reading that, it's like, it almost sounds as if that was my argument. Hey, I, let me make an argument, throw some Bible verses in there. But I'm not. The whole thing is scripture. It's, it's Hebrews. And there are many passages now which declare God is the defender of the orphans. And technically, God could defend those orphans and defend us without adopting us into his family. So I can't use those verses, there's 50, 60 of them, to prove the adoption of God. And so I can't technically use them. But when you just go through the verses that I just got going through with you, that we've just been looking at, it shows that God's way of defending us and of protecting us is to adopt us. We become family members. He's not just a stand-up guy saying, hey, don't pick on him. He's saying, I am his father. You leave him. You leave her alone. So all those other verses show how God protects us by erasing all of our connection with our old family, the seed of the serpent, as we're described in Genesis 3. And he makes us the seed of the woman, the seed of promise. In, uh, Noah had that prophecy of Japheth entering into the tents of Shem through adoption. In Genesis 11, Japheth being the nations and Shem being the family of God. So he has this picture of the whole earth being adopted, entering into those tents. They legally become Shem's family. Now it's perhaps the most poignant and central picture of salvation. This is how God defends the fatherless. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families, Psalm 68. Now Paul tells the Galatians that the unity of our faith is a family-based unity. Galatians 3:26-29 says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, and there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus, if you belong to Christ. Then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. <clears throat> now, just as an aside here, there's been a debate on kinism going on. That's a, that's a form of... of um, of a segregationism that's been been dignified as being somehow biblical and the the sin of kinism as you see in this context is 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 not so much the racism it's the horror of denying god's fatherhood to someone else who is made a christian the same way you are and brought into the same adopted family the same way you were it's like saying i am more of an adopted son than you are i am more of an adopted daughter than you are because of some irrelevant issue in Christ, <clears throat> racism is pure blasphemy. Now, if Paul's to be trusted, he tells one of the most unbelievable things about our relationship to the God of the universe. He says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. He told the Romans that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Daddy, Father, the most intimate things you could call him. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Your whole heritage, who and what you are, which is the entire earth, belongs to you. Adoption into God's family is parallel to the old world adoption. 
that was the backdrop of it, in which a person, for any number of reasons, is outside of the family who adopts him. On adopting that child, or an adult, he has all of the claims a race of any form of filial piety or of blood or a society that bound him to his, his former parents and culture and life. It erases all the same claims parents have on their child. Whatever American adopt, adoption is, I, I really don't know. No, and that's what in the other thread was so concerning to this person. And I'm not sure what American adoption is, but I am sure they have figured out a way to profiteer or corrupt this holy act as they have sex and birth itself. But the act of erasing the old bonds and replacing them with the new is not a strange idea. It's not the result of any American perversion. It's what God does for us. It's what he does for you. It's what he offers you if you're not a Christian. It is salvation itself. You become a member of a new family. Now, I ought to end on this note, but there is one other issue that was raised several times in the thread I'm, that I was responding to then, and that is the concern that it is deceptive to erase the connection with the birth parents and hide their new identity with a new birth certificate, that somehow that's a deception of the American uh, ad adoption system. Look, I want to just get down to the bottom of it. An orphan is one who does not have a mother or a father. When it's a willful act, then it's an abandonment by the mother. When a mother, for any reason, voluntarily gives up her child, she has abandoned it. If a father does it, he has abandoned it. I feel human sympathy at the tragedy that must lead to something like this. But any mother who abandons her child is a mother who abandons her child. It's the end of the story. It is an ultimate act. It's not comparable to any other act. It is the, it's as far as you can go. It's what you compare any other act to. It's like, I feel like an abandoned child. Uh, what else could be worse? Now, somebody could say, well, they tricked me. They preyed upon me. I, I, I needed the money. They lied to me. Yes, perhaps all that is true. But in the end, if you voluntarily gave up your child, then you abandoned your child because you thought that that child could do better without you which is the noblest reason for, for giving a child up for adoption. Or you did so because you wanted something yourself, and you, in essence, sold the child. That's the basest of reasons. But regardless of whether it's for the basest or for the ultimate of good reasons, regardless of that, it's ultimate. Nothing can else can compare, which is why God uses it to compare his love. Do you know God the way a mother, a child knows his mother? God says, can a mother abandon her nursing child? That's the relationship he holds out with you. Yes, says God, but I will never abandon you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, is his promise. Abandoning your child is not the same as having her taken away from you by force. And if that's what you're thinking, that's not at all what I'm talking about here. Also, it's not the under unforgivable sin, even if you choose to do it. And most often, it's not a sin at all. It's a noble act of love. But it is the ultimate definition of irrevocable separation, however it is mourned. It is done in hopes that there is one who can adopt your child and give her what you cannot, or in hopes that someone can give you what the child cannot. Thus, it can be an ultimate selfless act of love, as I said, but it's a final act, irrevocable, like pregnancy itself. There are hundreds of reasons someone gets pregnant. But once, regardless of why, once you're pregnant, you are a mother. You're nothing else. It's all you can be. Once abandoned, not stolen, you irrevocably give up your child. The child and the parents need protection against women who can no more stick with the decision they made in adoption than they, they could stick with the decision they made in the sexual union through which God, not the mother, gave his child life. His child life. He then entrusted it to her. That's why things like adoption, abortion, these things are ultimate acts. Uh, conception, they're, they're, they're points of no return in a person's life. And that's why you take the child if he's put up for adoption, and very often you protect that child from the past coming back and trying to drag it back into the past until the child can become an adult, and then as an adult can meet the parents who, for whatever reason, gave the child up in hopes that the child could have a better life. 
And I just wanted to share that with you because I wanted you to see what I had quite forgotten is that the idea of adoption is central to salvation. It's central to ultimate maternal love. How, how is there any more love than that in a nursing child? It's, it's compared to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, of God transforming you into a new creature, of working in your life. It's comparable to, uh, it's, it's, it's the metaphor that God uses uh, for almost every key aspect of what it means to be a Christian. The, the uh, way in which Christians are, are one, on the one hand, and in another sense, the way, be, because we're a family, but the other thing, when he talks about there's no uh, male or female, Greek or Hebrew, uh, there's no insider and outsider. When you're in Christ Jesus, it's like you're in a new family, and that's, that's the analogy you look. So that's why I just couldn't just walk aside and say, hey, there's nothing in the Bible that talks about adoption. It's stunningly important what God has done with you. And I would also say, since many of you watching this are a bunch of Presbyterians like me, intimacy with God is probably not your strong suit. You're not a charismatic after all. Those of you who are intimate with God just go, yeah, that's the problem with Presbyterians. But when Paul holds out to you and says, God is the most intimate father you could possibly have, you may have never had a father with whom you could be in intimate. You may never have had that relationship with God, much less your own father. But you can have that. That is what God's holding out to you as a Christian right now. I'm not speaking evangelistically to somebody who doesn't know the Lord. They probably aren't listening to this anyway. I'm talking to those of you who know God and know Jesus Christ, but have never known that intimacy with the Father. Just saying, when the Bible talks about adoption, it's talking about bringing you into one of the most intimate relationships you could have, a baby nursing on his mother's breast. What more intimacy is there than that? And God says, yeah, that's exactly the intimacy I, I have for you. Could you please talk to me? Could you please just taste and see that the Lord is good and quit crying about your problems? Thank you for listening to this episode of No Neutrality on the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network. Don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to download your favorite audiobooks and podcasts. And if you are a Christian Reconstructionist blogger and you'd like to contribute your blogs into this audio blog format, click on the volunteer link on our website, send us an email, and let us know you'd like to join the team. May Christ be glorified and His kingdom extended from sea to sea, and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.